Steve Jackson game has been one of the most iconic games companies since the very, very early 80s. Uh, partly because of the role-playing games that they produce and big part as well because of the Munchkin line which keeps producing really stunning uh, artwork and really stunning gameplay. Uh, I'm looking forward to hear what Andrew Hacker, the line development for Munchkin, has to say about what Steve Jackson Games is coming up with soon and sharing some stories of Steve Jackson as a company. Um, sit back and relax because I have the feeling that we are going to hear some really, really unique stories. Enjoy. I'd like to welcome Andrew Hacker. Um, Andrew, you have been in um, Steve Jackson Games for long enough to know what you're talking about. I, I would like to think so. <laughs> Sometimes I'm disabused of that. <laughs> and and uh, you obviously work with Munchkin, which is, at the very least, the most recognizable artwork in a ongoing game ever. I believe so, yes. <laughs> um, so, so Libby, what do you do uh, in Steve Jackson games? Why are you here? Why, why am I here? Uh, I'm here because I was invited, and thank you for that. Um, I've been working for Steve Jackson Games as an employee or a freelancer since 2000, and those of you who were here last hour, I'm going to repeat a lot of that and I apologize. Um, I started off working uh, a brief stint as a marketing writer. Um, we mutually agreed that was a bad idea, so I switched over to uh, editing GURPS books, editing some other materials, um, did that for a while on staff, um, left to go pursue another job for a while, but continued working as a freelancer. And then at the start of 2009, I uh, came back to run the Munchkin line. Um, Steve had so much work to take care of that he wasn't getting to actually design games, so they brought me in to do all the things that weren't designing Munchkin games. Um, and then over the past few years, I've actually gotten into the design side as well. Um, Steve, for those of you who don't know, Steve Jackson Games was founded in 1980, 33 years ago, um, because Steve wanted the control of designing games and running his own company, and obviously he's been doing well at it. Um, we're up to, I, I have written down here 36 employees, and I realized I'd forgotten one, so 37 employees, uh, full-time and part-time, uh, some located in Austin, Texas, where our office is. Many of them are freelancers, uh, located all over North America. Uh, we have our MIB control, who's in charge of our volunteer demo program, who lives in Germany. So it, we are truly a worldwide company, um, and it's been a great, a great time. It is far and away the best job that I've ever had. Um, it is, I don't actually get to just play games all day. That would be great, um, but it's kind of like a, a steady diet of ice cream. After a while, it would get old. Um, it, it, it's a job, but at the end of the day, it's a job making games, and there's nothing more awesome than that. True indeed. Uh, Steve Jackson Games, I mean, you guys have produced a lot of really iconic mm -hmm. work because although these days probably you're best known by the Munchkin line, sure. uh, which has been going on for ages, and it seems that it doesn't matter how many expansions you bring out, people are still eager to get more. It's, I, some days I don't understand it myself, but I appreciate it. Um, we had, last year, 2012 was our SJ Games best year ever. Munchkin was a huge part of that. Um, we actually had the Munchkin core game, just the original game, uh, over a million dollars in sales, which was frankly kind of astounding. Uh, but it's, it's a game that just keeps growing. Uh, as long as we can keep finding new jokes to tell or old jokes to recycle, we'll keep producing Munchkin. Um, but we also have plenty of other games. Um, I have a long list of things here to talk about, and I will try to be brief because I know some of you guys will have questions. Um, Steve's very first game design was called Ogre, and that was before there was a Steve Jackson Games. Uh, 1977 is a very simple hex-based war game, and last year we ran a Kickstarter for the ultimate designer's edition of that game. Um, I'm happy to say that last, well, yeah, last week, the printer sent over the final approval samples for every piece of that game, and I am hoping that I will get home and learn that we have approved everything and Ogre is officially at print. Only a year late. Um, this game, just to give you some stats on the Ogre Designers Edition, um, 
And if you back to the Kickstarter, you better start preparing for this now. Uh, the Ogre box is 50 centimeters by 60 centimeters by 15 centimeters. The base game that we're selling in stores, not the Kickstarter version, which has extra components, the base game is just going to be a little over 11 kilograms. Uh, if you got the Kickstarter version that had extra components, that's going to be 12. Um, please don't ask me how much it's going to cost to ship that to the UK because I will cry. Um, we have a conference table in our main conference room that is just a bit over four and a half meters long. And if you take, unpack the entire Ogre game, boards, counter sheets, rules, it fills that conference table. Um, this is a monster. And now we're talking about expansions because we're crazy. Um, and we're going to be working on those. Uh, one of the, com the commitments we made in the Ogre Kickstarter was a new edition of Car Wars, which is kind of Steve's other iconic mm -hmm. game from way back in the 80s. Uh, and we've started the process of talking to the fans about what do you want in Car Wars? What, what parts of it should we not change? What are the sacred cows? What should we update to make it more of a modern, a modern game? Um, so that process is ongoing. I hope that we will see the new Car Wars edition in 2015, but there's a lot of work to be done. So we're working on that. Um, the other game that we were known for really before Munchkin was GURPS, uh, the generic universal role-playing system, so-called because they could never come up with a better name for it. Um, and GURPS is still ongoing. It's Role-playing has obviously slowed down, and GURPS has slowed down along with everything else. Uh, but we have a new edition of the Discworld role-playing game, which is based on GURPS, and that should be out late this year or early next year. I'm not sure of the exact time. Uh, Phil Masters, who co-designed the original game, has done a complete revision for GURPS 4th edition. Uh, it's a monster book. Uh, we're working on filling it with artwork that's, you know, Discworld deserves the very best we can offer, so that's what we're going to provide for it. Uh, that's going to be a hardbound book. There will be a PDF version available as well. Um, as with many role-playing games, a lot of our support now is electronic and online. Uh, we got thriving PDF sales. Our store, E23, continues to do very well. Um, and we're going to be supporting GURPS online for the foreseeable future. Uh, we do have some more GURPS hardbacks coming. I don't think I've been cleared to talk about them yet. But uh, I know Sean Punch has talked about working on GURP Zombies. That's one of them that's coming out fairly soon. Uh, we got a new board game coming out in July called Castellan. Uh, it is a two-player game. It's got 100 plastic pieces, 28 cards. It takes about 30 minutes to play. Um, it's language independent, except for the rules. The cards have no words on them at all. Um, it's great for kids, great for adults, very simple game to pick up, but there's some very subtle strategies to it. And we're doing two versions of it. Uh, one version is just English language, but one version has five different languages. Um, and so that's going to, we hope, sell well in Europe. And you can combine the two games for a four-player game. Um, we're very excited about that. That's, that's been in development now for a couple of years. How many people in here have been watching Tabletop? Will Wheaton's online show. How many of you have heard of the tabletop effect? <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that we discovered, and we, not just SJ Games, but the whole industry was, once a game was on Will's show tabletop, it sold out. And we're no exception to that. We had planned for it, we thought. Uh, we've had three, three games on there, um, Shea Geek, Zombie Dice, and Munchkin. And Zombie Dice sold out within a week of the tabletop episode going up. And we have been racing to keep it in print ever since. Um, Munchkin, fortunately, we had seen this coming and printed a lot. Um, we had the last print run of Munchkin, the 24th printing, was 100,000 copies. And we said, well, that's easily two years supply. No. Uh, it ran out eight months after it came out. So the next printing is considerably more than that. Uh, Shea Geek, it was a little bit of delayed effect because the Shea Geek episode was late enough in the season that a lot of the distributors had stocked up in advance. So we said, okay, we're not really seeing the bump, and then it hit us. Um, 
So we've got a Shea Geek reprint this fall that's coming out. Thank you, Tabletop. And we've got a Shea Geek expansion coming out before the end of the year. 56 card expansion, brand new cards, brand new art. John Kavalik art, mm. you were talking about John's work earlier. Um, we've also, uh, last year at Gen Con, we announced Shea Guild. Uh, it's been delayed a little bit because of, well, Ogre and a lot of other projects, but we expect to have that out next spring. Um, so those of you who like the Guild web series, this is the Guild All as Roommates. Um, it's going to be awesome. Uh, some things coming out for Zombie Dice, some extra support. Uh, something that should be on the market very shortly, if I can get this open. Um, something we've been asked for, Zombie Dice score pads. So you don't have to find a whole bunch of counters or cocktail napkins and a pen. Um, cheap, disposable product. You can, they'll be in the game stores. Um, and the score pads will be included in the Zombie Dice brain case. Um, the biggest problem we've had with Zombie Dice is it's in a cardboard tube and over time, opening and closing and opening and closing, it wears out. So we've, put, we've created this plastic tube for it. Sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. I apologize to the sound engineer. Um, that's going to be out this summer as well. And we're working on Zombie Dice 3, the next expansion, uh, called the School Bus. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. So, um, and then we get to Munchkin, um, which is, you know, eating my brain. Uh, the big news for Munchkin is, of course, that Munchkin Pathfinder, the new core set, uh, will be out this fall. We'll have some preview copies at Gen Con. I have a mock-up right here. Um, and if you can track me down in this DVM and my table's not already full and you want to play it, I would love to show you Munchkin Pathfinder. I'm very happy with how this turned out. Uh, UK Games Expo is the first place where we're actually showing off the actual cards with the art. So uh, those of you who know the Pathfinder setting, uh, you're going to like fighting a lot of goblins. Um, the Munchkin boosters, the 15-card boosters that we started coming out with a few years ago have been phenomenally successful. Um, it turns out if you say, hey, you got five bucks, buy some Munchkin, it works. And we've had, uh, we've got several boosters on this year's schedule. Munchkin Easter eggs is already out. Um, we've got Munchkin dragons coming up this summer. So you want to you fight and kill dragons? This is the set for you. Uh, Munchkin Apocalypse is our most recent core game, and we've got a booster based on the Mars Attacks trading cards that's going to be out this summer. Um, and we just announced to distribution, so I'm telling y'all a slight secret, uh, there's going to be a Halloween booster called Tricky Treats that's going to be out this fall. And uh, when we were talking with Paizo about Munchkin Pathfinder, we said, you know, the problem, the problem with Pathfinder is there's just not quite enough goblins. So before the end of the year, there's going to be a Munchkin Pathfinder booster called Gobsmacked that's full of goblins. Um, we've got the boxes of holding product is out of print, which was fold-up cardboard boxes to store all your Munchkin cards so you don't have to carry a stack like this. Uh, but we're doing a new set that's going to be out very shortly. Uh, it's got three boxes for doors, treasures, and dungeons. So the most requested thing from the first set was, I need a way to store my dungeons, so okay. We, we listened to that. Um, the dice sets for Munchkin have been very popular. Uh, we have one for Munchkin Apocalypse coming out. Or sorry, Munchkin Apocalypse is the radioactive dice, and they're out. For Munchkin Zombies, we have the Decay D6 that's going to be out later this summer. Uh, it'll be six dice, four cards, because you can't have a Munchkin game that doesn't have cards in it. Um... We are currently playtesting Munchkin Zombies 4. Uh, it's a 56-card expansion that's probably going to be out early next year. Uh, and one thing that I actually have not talked about publicly yet, we did a collection of Munchkin bookmarks called the Munchkin Bookmark Collection because we're not always creative. Um, we do a lot of promotional bookmarks to give away to people. Um, they have different rules on them. Some of them you have to tear up. Some of them you have to give to your friends so they can use them against you later. Um, but it's been a little bit hard to get for some people because you have to be in the right place, go to a convention, your game store has to be able to get them. So we said we can make a package available to sell. Um, we're also doing a lot of promotional cards that are giveaways, the same sort of thing. You 
run into a man in black who's doing a demo. You run into us at a convention and get them. Uh, so we're going to find a way to package some of those for sale. So you can get some of the promotional cards that have been sometimes a little hard to come by. Um, and that is a spoiler because we've never talked about that publicly before. So uh, I have now been talking straight for about 20 minutes. Um, so I'll go back to you. And um, I wonder, uh, there was obviously an awful lot of questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, but one that's been burning in my, my brain for a very long time. Uh, some people have been very critical of big companies deciding to go onto Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you guys went with Ogre, uh, to say that you succeeded would be not just an injustice, it would be a <laughs> plain idiocy. Um, you did incredibly well. What has the reaction been towards your company after that? It was, it was a bit of a risk because Kickstarter... When we, when we launched the Ogre Kickstarter, was seen as kind of a small, independent platform. Um, we lucked out because Cool Mini or not launched the Zombie Side Kickstarter about three days before we launched Ogre. Mm. So they kind of paralleled each other, and it was one of those things where that you couldn't point to just one and say, you're, you're doing it wrong. Um, and I don't think we were doing it wrong. I think what we did is we, we showed that Kickstarter could be used for established companies just as well as people starting up. And I don't think that we've been hurting people by doing it. Uh, I think we called a lot of attention to Kickstarter. And what we're hearing from people is, I didn't know anything about Kickstarter until Zombicide came out, Ogre came out on Kickstarter. And a lot of people are now seeing projects supported because of the people that we brought into it. Um, we learned a lot from the Ogre Kickstarter. Um, some of those lessons were very hard, such as don't throw a lot of extra stuff onto your, your thing at the last minute because you're going to confuse the people who have to track all of it. Um, some of it was it's really expensive to ship games to Europe. You're <laughs> um, telling us we have to pay for the postage. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Um, it's... We're very proud of the Ogre game that came as a result of Kickstarter. There's so much in there that couldn't have happened if we hadn't had the support from the, the almost 6,000 people who backed that Kickstarter. Um, and we're going to take the lessons that we learned from it, and the Car Wars Kickstarter, when it eventually runs, is going to be, we hope, immensely better. Um, was there a backlash? Yeah, there, there was some of a backlash, but really I think the reaction has been mostly positive. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, of, of Munchkin, mm -hmm. uh, there are how many how many expansions has Munchkin got? So there far? are currently thirteen Munchkin core sets. Uh, Munchkin Apocalypse was the thirteenth, which seems appropriate. Um, expansions easily over two dozen, especially counting the boosters. How do you guys go about designing it in a way that you know, or you at least try to make sure? that is still going to be well received. Because there, there is an awful lot of people saying, oh, God, another expansion. And yet people keep buying it and people keep getting an awful lot of value out of it. What is the creative process behind that? Um, we don't think about the people who say, oh, God, it's another Munchkin set, because they're not the people we're trying to sell to. Mm -hmm. um, the original game sell, outsells every other Munchkin thing by far, usually by a factor of 10 or more. Um, and that tells us that we're reaching a lot of new gamers who don't already know Munchkin. Um, so it's kind of a, a self-regenerating market. People, people discover Munchkin, they learn to play Munchkin, they find out there's expansions, some of them will go buy them, some of them are perfectly happy with just the original game. Um, it, we hear from people who are like, I can't believe there's so much Munchkin out there, but you know what? There's lots of other really good games out there too. They, you don't have to buy every single thing of Munchkin. Steve's gonna kill me for saying that, but <laughs> <laughs> um, buy what you like, play what you enjoy. And um, sometimes I hear from people who are like, I, I, I hate to tell you this, but I really don't like Munchkin. And I was like, you know what? That's awesome. Take what you enjoy, play what you enjoy. You don't feel obligated to play a game that you don't like. Um, the process of creating a new set, we just want to make it fun. We do a lot of playtesting of all of our Munchkin things because 
If there's something that's not fun, we want to get rid of it. We don't want people to ever have a bad time playing Munchkin because of the game. Um, if they have a bad time because of a poor card draw, because they don't have, have luck, well, you know what? Next game, maybe you'll get luckier. Um, how much success um, of the Munchkin line do you think should be attributed to John Kovalik and, and, and his artwork? Is it that man keep churning pieces up one after the other, and they're all brilliant. John's a, John's a machine. Um, no, that's not true. If he were a machine, he wouldn't keep complaining <laughs> about how his arm hurts. Um, we keep John very busy, and his, his artwork is a big part of the success of Munchkin, obviously because it's a big part of the visual appeal. Um, it pairs very well with the jokes that Steve writes, the cards that Steve writes, the cards that I write. Um, Lenny Balsera, my assistant, has been doing some design work. You're going to start seeing his name on Munchkin products. Um, we've done some sets without John, and they've been pretty successful, but I, I can't say too much about how how much of Munchkin is is John's work. Um, he's he's a true part of the team. If we could get convince him to move out of Madison and come to Austin, we would. We keep dangling barbecue in front of him. It hasn't worked so far. Um, and it's every so often uh, we're using Dropbox to transfer artwork now because it's easier and I can pull it up on my phone. So I'll be sitting someplace looking at art on my phone laughing my head off and people are just i i'm pretty sure there have been police called and said there's this insane guy sitting in the, the airport um it's it's seeing new art from john is one of the best parts of my job um ogre ogre um why now why why did steve decide hey i i have this game from 30 years ago i i'm, I'm i let's bring it back why the last time we did a new edition of Ogre was 2000. And it sold, it sold really well, but it had been out of print for a while. And Steve's been thinking about the sixth edition, which we're now calling the designer's edition, for five years and wanting to do it. Um, it just it felt like the right time. It was, you know, it's his, it's his baby. It's his very first game. And one of the things that he said as part of the Kickstarter was, this is the Ogre version that he's always wanted. It's kind of like what George Lucas says about Star Wars, except we're not wrecking Ogre this time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Controversial. <laughs> but true. And so no Jar Jar Binks of Ogre then? I make no promises. Um, <laughs> so it was just, in a large part, it, Munchkin, he said in the very first Ogre posting on Kickstarter, Munchkin has afforded him the chance to do the Ogre version that he's always wanted as a thank you to the fans who have supported us for the last 33 years. Mm -hmm. um, Munch, I mean, it's an 11 kilo game and it costs $100. <laughs> By all rights, this should be a $400 game because of the amount of stuff that's in there. And we're selling it for 100 because we don't want people to feel like they have to pay $400 for this game. Uh, it's a thank you to the fans who've been with us the whole time. Um, when it's when it's sold out, I seriously doubt we will reprint it because oh my god, it's an eleven kilo game. Um, so this is kind of a a, a limited edition. One, if you can call a print a twelve thousand a limited edition, um, but it's the it's a game that we hope people are going to be proud to have on their shelf or under their shelf or as their shelf, um, and play for years and years to come. It's, it's a beast, but it's a beautiful beast. Um, do you guys ever see yourselves going heavily into the, the tablet market and, and going digital with your games? Uh, having digital games has been a dream of ours for a long time, but none of us are programmers. None of us are digital designers. Um, we've talked to some companies over the years. We just haven't quite found the right partner yet. Um, we've done a couple of digital games. Zombie Dice is on mm -hmm. iOS and uh, Windows 7, or sh will shortly be on Windows 7. Uh, we've got the Ogre War Room, which is an Ogre support app that's on several platforms. Um, Dino Hunt Dice, which is our new dice game that's based on Zombie Dice. The iOS version is out. Um, and we're working with a company called Tenderbox Entertainment out of the Pacific Northwest on an Xbox version of Munchkin. Mm -hmm. um, so... 
we don't we don't want to push too heavily into that market and do it wrong mm -hmm. because that could really hurt us. We want to make sure that we're doing it right so we're being cautious. Um, it's Steve's very concerned about the quality. He wants a good game experience. So we're going to we're going to be a little bit slow about it and take our time and make sure that we're doing it right so that it's when it comes out it's the very best that it can be. Um, but yes, we would very much like to be in that market more than we are. Well, we would like to have you, so get on with it. <laughs> uh, uh, audience, have you thought of questions? Yeah. Please. Okay. I think I've got kind of three thoughts. Okay. First of all, I just want to take the opportunity to thank you for Munchkin. Well, thank you very much. That Steve gets most of the credit because it's his game to start with. But I've got, I've got two lads. We will play Munchkin. Uh, we're on holiday this next week. Munchkin is there to be played. We will sit around the table and enjoy it. So That's a new expansion, Munchkin Holidays. <laughs> um, it's actually um, we've done four Christmas themed boosters and we did a product last year that combined all four of them just on sale in stores in the past couple of months called Munchkin Holiday Surprise that, that's part of our Christmas tradition well, is to play Munchkin with the Christmas booster set um, I'm a historical war game really and so on. Um, I could kind of phrase an old question about Ogre and the fans of Blitz which is very similar Make that as an observation. Um, I prefer GDB myself personally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I ogre great game, um, but for me, GDB is the game that I enjoy most. I wonder if there's any plans to kind of promote GDB again. Well, I, the it's my preferred part of it. The, the, the ogre, when I say the ogre designers edition, it's not just ogre. It's ogre. It's GEV. It's at least part of battlefields. I mean, it's there are. I think the final count was over 1,500 counters in this game. Yeah, I know. Uh, and we had to check every single one of them. Well, and we, not me. Fortunately, Ogre's not Munchkin. So, um, I, was, I was, at one point, I was one of about four people in the company who was not working on Ogre in some capacity. Um, so, this, this combines not quite everything, but almost everything that's ever been published for Ogre officially by the company. So GEV is absolutely in this ogre box. So you, I, I hope you will be happy with what we did with it because, yeah, <laughs> it's we're 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 planning when we finally say ogre is at print. It's too late to make more changes. It's going to be here in a few months. Uh, we're talking about just taking a day off to play games and have a pizza party because we're going to need it, <laughs> and then we'll sleep. It's already. One of my most favourite Steve Jackson games is Awful Green Things from Out of Space. <laughs> Can we have a reprint? And, and credit where that works due, that's originally a Tom Wom game that was published in Dragon Magazine back late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and Tom's been very gracious about giving us the rights to republish it. Um, we did a new version last year or the year before uh, with a good quality mounted board and if you want to take a look at it, our men in black have it outside the expo hall if you want to want to see it. Uh, I expect we'll keep that in print for quite a while because it is a really fun game. Um, it's tough to find a good two-player game sometimes, but Awful Green Things is absolutely one. It's one of my iconic games that I tell my students in terms of design and gameplay and simplicity. It's yeah. really, really fun. Next question. Please. How did it come about that you're sitting here at UK Expo, and why is it important for Steve Jackson to send, you know, spend money to send people here to the UK? Um, it came about because, um, first of all, as I said, Games Expo invited me. Um, we work very closely with his DV, and they do our, most of our, most or all of our UK distribution. Um, so they actually, there was a retailer day on Friday that they brought us over to talk to retailers about what's coming up. Um, part of it is I've never been to the UK before. So this was an excuse for me to come over and spend a, a weekend in lovely, cool weather. It's about 35 back home right now. <laughs> it's you, Robbie Ting. Robbie Ting. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's 35 Celsius, not Fahrenheit. I want to make be clear about that. Um, so this is one of the, the beautiful perks about especially my second stint at SJ Games, is it's let me travel a lot more. Um, 
sometimes that's that's stressful when I have a lot of trips back to back. But it also means I got to go to Essen a couple of years ago. I've never been to Germany before. And if you have not been to Essen, holy God, is that an impressive show. Um, I would love to go to PAX Australia, but I don't think that's going to happen in the, in the near future. But I get to go to San Diego Comic Con every year. Uh, New York Comic Con the past couple of years. Gen Con, of course. Um, and... One of the best parts of my job is getting to go out and meet the people who buy the, and play our games. Um, and 98% of them are lovely people who say nothing but nice things. And the other 2%, the, they say things and it, it's, it's good feedback. What can we improve? Um, so um, one of the reasons I came here is I've never been. And I wanted to meet people over here who play the games and hear what they think. So thank you guys for coming to the this panel, thank you guys for coming to Games Expo. Um, thank you guys for not having it snow this weekend. <laughs> well, it's been really close shave. Um, uh, but what, what actually, what differences have you seen between uh, the, the, the US conventions and the UK conventions? Because you guys have a very different approach to, to gaming and, and the social aspect of gaming. Honestly, I haven't seen that many differences. Um, this is, I mean, this is not a, a Gen Con or San Diego size show, but it's bigger than I thought it was going to be. Um, a lot of regional shows in the States are a few hundred people, not a few thousand. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is how many families there are. How many, I mean, young, young kids, teenagers, um, mothers as well as fathers, um, and sitting there and playing games and having a great time. And that is wonderful to see because that means that there's a thriving continuity of the hobby of people who grow up playing these games and will continue doing it, we hope. Um, you guys do talk a little funny, I will admit that. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, questions from the audience? Any more questions? Michael Fox, you have a question? I've got one. Why not? Um, Andrew, you guys uh, on Munchkin work with about 12 billion different IPs, it looks like. I mean, so you've got everything, you've got Conan, you've got the Guild, you've got Penny Arcade. Mm -hmm. um, how does that work? Do you go, do you go to the companies and uh, to the different people and say, look, would you like to do something involved in Munchkin? Or do they come to you, or is it a bit of, a, a bit of both? Uh, we resisted licensing for a long time because there, from about two days after Munchkin came out, we had ideas for, we would love to do Munchkin X. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to make sure that the game was well served, that it was established, because licensing is, is very dicey sometimes. I, no pun intended there, sorry. Um, if you do a license wrong, you hurt your own game, but you also put, run the risk of hurting the other property. So we want to be very careful about it. And we said, let's make sure that Munchkin is strong enough to support what we're trying to do. And it just happened a couple of years ago that we got several expressions of interest from people and were talking to some people and said, you know, we might be interested in doing this. So there has been some of each. We've approached some people, we've been approached by some people. Um, Pathfinder was one of those where we were just sort of talking to people at Paizo and all of us all sort of at the same time said, you know, what would be kind of cool? Um, and I have to give them credit. They've been very generous with their time. With um, I'm not a Pathfinder player myself, so I had lots of stupid questions, um, and they gave me very patient answers. Um, but they have been wonderful to work with. I've really enjoyed this process, and I now understand that Pathfinder is a, is a really good, solid system and setting, and I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to do more in that world, I'll say that. Are there any um, IPs that you sort of dream of you'd love to get your hands on and, and put Munchkin in those worlds? You know, uh, I, I hesitate to answer that because there have been a couple that I have been like, that's never going to happen, that have, like Pathfinder, that have turned out to actually be happening. Um, Shoot for the Moon, Star Wars Munchkin. Um, you know, We'll make, birds, we'll make Jar Jar a monster so you can kill him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like really low level as well, just so you can just smash him. Repeatedly. Mm -hmm. But you have to keep having him pop back. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
no, there, there, there are some dream properties that I really don't want to discuss because I don't want to jinx it. Um, but once the light, once the licensing door cracked open, it just kind of blew open. You know, we've done, we did the Guild Booster, which sold phenomenally well. Um, where uh, there was one based on Skull Kickers, the Image comic from Jim Zubkovich, which. The nice thing about licensing from a comic book is you've got the art, which saves time, and lets John rest his arm for a couple of weeks. Um, Penny Arcade. I mean, the fact that Penny Arcade was like, yeah, we'd love to, for you guys to do a Munchkin was awesome. Um, we've got Pathfinder. Um, there might be some others coming up that I can't talk about yet. Not been. <laughs> <laughs> Not been Munchkin. So... Um, it's, it's interesting because when you're facing a blank slate, you're designing a new Munchkin set like Munchkin Apocalypse, you know, it's, you're not beholden to anybody else. You, you don't have to treat, the, treat a, another property right, but at the same time, you don't have that property to draw from. So it's a different sort of challenge. Um, with a licensed property like Munchkin the Guild, we had, you know, five seasons of the Guild to look at. And it was kind of, you know, an embarrassment of riches. Which pieces of it do we pull for the game? Uh, so it's, it's a different sort of design challenge, but it's a lot of fun. And it brings new people in. There are people who knew the guild but had no idea what Munchkin was who got into Munchkin because they said, well, I, I picked this up because it said the guild on it. And then I realized that, well, there's this whole game behind it. Um, so it, it can open some doors that hadn't been opened before. Um, you have a question there, yes. sir. Speaking of IP, how, how do you go with any new game about uh, protecting uh, property? Well, Steve, Steve does pretty pretty carefully get things trademarked. Um, our play testers, for the most part, we don't say, please sign this NDA. If you talk about it, the lawyers are going to hunt you down. Because on some aspect, you want people to say, I play tested this new Munchkin game and it's awesome, except for these things, but they're going to fix those. Um, it's, we don't particularly worry about it. Munchkin's an established enough brand at this point that if somebody tried to rip us off, they get called out on it. Um, so it's, we do all of our development in-house, so it's not really that much of an issue. More questions? What would you guys like to see from Munchkin that we haven't done yet? Munchkin Thrones, um, The Walking Game. Munchkin. Game of Munchkin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like Game of Munchkin, that would be really cool. Um, Munchkin Defiance. I keep going, by the way, so don't, <laughs> either you intervene or I keep going. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? You know, David Tennant's here, so maybe I should sit him down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's, again, that's a case of, that is so awesome that we're actually a little scared to approach it because it's kind of like scaling the mountain. You know, you make one false step and it's, it, you're, it's a quick flight back down. Um, we don't, we don't want to overextend ourselves and, and take on too much. So we're kind of doing baby steps a little bit. Doctor Who Munchkin would be great. Mm. Someone else would have to design it because I hate to admit I don't watch the show. Um, but, you know, maybe that would get me to start. Who knows? Not related to Munchkin, it's a very badly... Next question. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, a, it's a tricky one. Um, I'm employed by a public sector organisation. Um, slightly ahead of best. About ten odd years ago, I think it do with kind of cybercrime and so on, the CIA got very interested. Was it the CIA? <laughs> it, and the security force. The Secret the Service. service. Um, Secret, yeah. In 1990, so... Yeah. Ancient, story yeah, ancient history for us. Um, I'll give you the short version, but everything related to this is on our site. If you go to sjgames.com slash ss for secret service, I promise. Um, we were working on a game called, and this is before my time, but I'll say we. We're working on a game called GURPS Cyberpunk, an expansion for the GURPS setting. And the editor on the book was contacting various hackers he happened to know online to say, you know, 
take a look at this, see if it seems feasible in a game context. Well, those hackers were being investigated by the Secret Service, uh, who's part of the Treasury Department in the United States, for you know interfering with trade. And his name popped up in the thing, so the Secret Service got a somewhat sketchy search warrant for the company. And March 1st, 1990, the government came calling at SJ Games and almost shut the company down. They seized a bunch of computers, a bunch of hard drives. They seized the manuscript of the book. And back in those days, I mean, it was all printouts and paste up boards. And uh, long story short, this led to the foundation of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF. And Steve had to make a hard choice, can I keep going? And he decided, we're not going to let this stop us. He had to lay off half the staff. But they focused all their efforts on getting this one book put out because when you put the book seized by the government on the cover of your role-playing <laughs> supplement, <laughs> that's a great sales tool. Um, and he and the, the EFF sued the government and won. Um, and it turns out in the United States, you're not allowed to sue the government unless they say you can. Um, but... He had a federal judge actually scolding the Secret Service for the, the, the shoddy job that they did. And it's all on our website, and you can go read it, and it's fascinating historical reading. Um, and there's still a line in our employee manual today, if somebody with a badge shows up, get out of their way. Um, but it's not a problem. It, it's, that was a one-time thing in the very early days of cybercrime investigation. The government's learned a lot since then. Well, my, my personal opinion is that I think that the government agencies need to talk to creative, intellectual people. Mm -hmm. Because when it comes to cyber hacking and so on, it's the people with the wild ideas that need to be sharing those with the government. You know, this is kind of ethical hacking stuff. How you, how you should do it. But just stealing questions here. Illuminati. We've not mentioned Illuminati. Mm. We've not mentioned it at all, and that's a complete oversight on my part because. Yeah. It still sells phenomenally well. Um, we Steve has been mentioning on our forums, we're looking at a new version of the expansion called Brainwash, which is lets you change the rules of the game as you go. Um, but uh, those of you who are occasionally on YouTube may have seen that we knew something about 9-11 before it happened. If you look at these particular... Yeah. There's, there's lots of people who would love... <laughs> for us to be involved with that, and I don't get it. But um, Illuminati is a, is a really fun game about controlling the world from behind the scenes. So there's a lot, if you're really into finding conspiracies, there's a lot there to look at. Um, it's, it's what we call an evergreen game. It keeps selling. And, you know, we'll, there will probably be more Illuminati content down the road. I think I can safely say that. And the Bavarian Illuminati themselves haven't given you a hard time. Yet. I'm not supposed to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Um, Andrew, I don't know if you've covered it. Sorry, I'm jumping in again. Um, the, uh, you inevitably had something of a spike of sales when Munchkin was featured on Tabletop. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve obviously was on there playing with the great and the good from uh, the world of uh, you know, Will Wheaton's world. Um, how did you guys cope with that? Did, did you expect that you were going to get a decent sales spike? Because it was quite in the early days of tabletop. I, I did talk about it a little bit at the beginning. Um, Munchkin, fortunately, had printed enough ahead of time that we saw the spike and we were, we were able to get it reprinted. Um, what I didn't mention was Munchkin Deluxe was the version that was on there, yeah. the one with the board. That one sold out immediately. And that one took us a while to get back into stock. Um, Tabletop has been nothing but good for the industry. Mm -hmm. And I want to give all credit to Geek and Sundry, to Will Wheaton, obviously, for bringing not just attention to the industry, but positive attention. Mm -hmm. By getting people who are like, I can't believe he's a gamer. I can't believe she's a gamer. Mm -hmm. Onto the show to play games and to show four people sitting around a table having a good time for half an hour. And it's... I'm very glad that they got a second season. I'm really pleased to see how the show is evolving over time. Um, 
I'm, I'm glad that my episode turned out as well as it did. <laughs> um, so that was, I was a little worried because I'm not an actor. I'm not a performer. I'm a game designer. So that turned out nicely. Um, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, and we're still coping with it. The, uh, the producer, Boyan Radakovich from Tabletop, and I've mangled your name, Bo, and I'm sorry, said almost every company has said there's been a sharp spike and then it's come down to a new plateau that was higher than the one before. And that's absolutely true of Munchkin, Zombie Dice, and Shea Geek. And so we're having to adjust our, our expectations for how games are going to be doing in the future based on, on Tabletop. Um, and we're going to be seeing some reprints that we hadn't expected to see, I think. Right. Thank you, everybody, so much for, for being here. Thank you, Andrew, for, for your well, Thank awesome. you for having me. Thank you guys for coming. Um, those of you who are watching this online later, thank you for putting up with us for an hour. Um, and and um, you're going to be around, so um, people are going to have a chance to have a go at the Munchkin Pathfinder. Absolutely. I'll be in the Expo Hall, probably in the Asdevium area, all afternoon. Um, I don't know what my plans are tonight. I don't fly out until the morning, so maybe cost me over the head and take a look at the game. Thank you very much. Thank you.